just want to welcome you to this new series on Revelation called Revealed. And what we're going to be doing is uncovering the mystery of Revelation. And we're in a unique time. Many people are looking at this book and uh, many are thinking about it because uh, some would go, we are in the end of days or the end of time. However, you might be surprised to know the Bible always talks about the last days. So before we dive into really the study in Revelation, I want to give a disclaimer because this book was not written to cause confusion for the follower of Jesus. Also, the book of Revelation was not written to cause division or to cause uh, debates within the church or to even promote speculation about the return or the coming of Jesus. And that might catch some people off guard because when it comes to the book of Revelation, it's been sometimes neglected or sometimes it's actually divided the church. So the purpose of Revelation is actually in chapter one, verse four, where it says that the book was actually written to bring grace and peace. So the book of Re Revelation is to bring grace and peace to the church. It's not written to cause divisions. It's not written to cause speculation about the return of Jesus. And many people would go, well, that's the purpose of the book. It's to take in the times that we're in and try to interpret it. However, Revelation is actually written to strengthen believers. In fact, E.F. Scott summed up the book of Revelation with a small statement. He said, it's a trumpet call to faith. So the book was actually written to strengthen the faith and encourage believers in their standing in Jesus. It's to uh, empower them against the anti-Christian forces in the world. Uh, and John is writing this book because Christians during his day are being persecuted. They're going through some hard times and uh, he wants them to be encouraged in the fact that even though the culture is going against the things of Jesus, the things of Christianity, just to stand firm in their faith, to stand firm in holiness, in the seductive culture, and also just to refute deception in the church. Uh, during this time, this is what we see the emphasis in Revelation is really on four themes. The sovereignty of God in Christ. The second thing, there's a satanic nature in the, in the world during that time, as well as our time. But the emperor during that time wanted to be called Lord and God. So John is writing this and he's trying to encourage his people, even though the people in the world think that's a joke and hilarious to the Christians for the emperor to say he's Lord and God is going in the face of the one true God. The third thing is there's the inescapable judgments of the Lord. So those who submit to Jesus were covered under his blood. Those of us who know salvation uh, were covered under what he did at the cross and the empty grave. However, uh, there's this sure issue of conflict between the church and the oppressive powers in the world. So as you read Revelation, you're going to see these themes come up over and over. The good news is if you're found in Jesus, the victory for you is sure. So hear this, Satan is defeated because of the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And this brings to us an anticipation. So as you watch this and you're found in Jesus, for believers, the ultimate completion of God's purpose of good for the world uh, is going to happen. He has made the world, he has created the world, he will redeem those who have called on his name, repented of sin. So we have this hope in Jesus. So when it comes to reading Revelation today, there's four things. Uh, these four things that I mentioned have actually characterized the history from the first century of our era to the present, and they're going to continue to do so until the return of Jesus. In fact, we are in the most, uh, I'll just say, we, we are living in a culture with some of the most opposition to the gospel and the church. 
uh, as the book of Revelation was being written, they were facing the same opposition to the church, opposition to God's word. And also there's this, um, I'll just say momentous spread of the gospel that's happening in the book of Revelation. And under severe persecution, the gospel always seems to go forth. So as you read the book of Revelation, understand that Christians are in the midst of this persecution, but yet the gospel of Jesus Christ is going forth. And uh, really what we need to see here is that uh, the gospel is often launched in our world through suffering, through hard times, through uh, difficulties. And uh, we see that over and over again. That was happening in Revelation. That will happen here today. And the gospel will still go forward. And what's happening as well is there's a collapse of many political powers over time. Uh, and this is just showing us that God is sovereign so we can go throughout history and see that we've had different rulers, different leaders, and those governments and leaders have all collapsed. However, God still reigns sovereign. So with the increasing, uh, instead of decreasing suffering of multitudes, it actually calls for Christians Wit to take the gospel and just to be a witness, to go out and to proclaim that to a broken and hurt world. We have this call to faith uh, because of our perfect Lamb of God, that Jesus has sent us on a mission into this broken world to declare the gospel. And I just go, isn't it any wonder that the book of Revelation has actually been one of the favorite books for Christians who are under persecution or under se severe oppression? And what this book should really do is the book should inspire endurance in the faith that it's totally worth following Jesus through the good and through the bad. The author of the book of Revelation, his name is John. He's the son of Zebedee. He's the brother of uh, James. And he's, he's the author of first and second and third John, as well as the book of John. And then this book, Revelation. He was a friend of Jesus. We know this about John. Uh, he couldn't stop talking about Jesus. He absolutely loved Jesus. He was sort of like the little brother to Jesus. They had this close relationship. So uh, what happens is John is just loving Jesus, telling others about Jesus. They actually try to kill John by boiling him alive. And somehow, by the grace of God, actually, he survives that. And then they can't get rid of him, so they just exile him to the island of Patmos. And that is where John writes this book. He gets this vision that Jesus gives to him, and he writes the book of Revelation. So if you have your Bible, Revelation chapter 1, I want to look at the first eight verses here tonight. But here's what it says in verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him, to show his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John. So the book of Revelation is a series of apocalypse visions. Now let's just pause there because there's three key words or phrases that I want you to see in this first verse of Revelation that are absolutely critical for understanding the book. You might underline them or highlight them, circle them if you do that. But number one is, you can circle or highlight, is the word revelation. The word revelation, which is the word apocalypsis. It literally means an uncovering of truth. It's a revelation of truth. The second word or the second phrase to highlight is this, things that must soon take place. So it's a revelation of something that is either happening or is going to happen soon. And then the third phrase that I'd like you to highlight or underline is made it known. He made this revelation known by sending his angel to his servant John in verse 1. So if you underline those words, underline those phrases, and then step back and see what we've got, we've got a revelation of something that is already happening or it's going to happen. And this book is actually written to make it known. 
Now, there is only one other time in the Bible where those three words or those phrases actually appear together. So I'd like to show us that in Daniel chapter 2, verse 28. Uh, Revelation is saturated with Old Testament references. So as you read Revelation, you're going to see that it goes to the Old Testament very often. Over 400 references to the Old Testament in the book. And this is the first. And it is huge for understanding this entire book. So what's happening in Daniel chapter 2 is... Daniel is actually interpreting a dream, a vision for King Nebuchadnezzar about the future. So as Daniel interprets it, uh, and what we're about to read, we're about to read the word apocalypsis in this. It's actually used five times. It's something that will come to pass. It's used uh, also three. Uh, the second phrase we talked about is used three times, and then make it known appears two times. All the phrases that are in Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, we read them in Daniel chapter 2, verses 28 to 30. So I want you to read those with me. So in our Bibles, Daniel chapter 2, verses 28 to 30, and this is what we read. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. And he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head as you lay in bed are these. To you, O king, as you lay in bed come thoughts of what would be after this. And he who reveals mysteries made known to you what is to be. But as for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because of any wisdom that I have, more than all the living, but in order that the interpretation may, may be made known to the king and that you may know the thoughts of your mind. So here's what Daniel's doing. He's saying to King Nebuchadnezzar, you've had a dream of something that is going to come to pass and God through me is going to make it known to you. So he's revealing what the dream means to King Nebuchadnezzar. And then right after this, Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar the dream that he had. He describes it perfectly. And the dream that he had had all kinds of symbols and images, stones, iron and clay, bronze, silver and gold. And then Daniel interprets what those symbols mean. And I want you to hear sort of the climax of that interpretation. So go over to verse 44 in Daniel chapter 2. It says this, and in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forevermore. So catch this. Catch what Daniel said. Because God uses a dream, he uses a vision to reveal or to uncover the reality that one day God was going to set up a kingdom that will never end, that God will one day set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. So when John comes and opens the book of Revelation in chapter 1, the very first verse he points us back to, out of all the places in the Bible, is the day when God revealed through a vision how his kingdom would be established and how it would never, ever be destroyed. This book is a revelation through a vision of how God's kingdom is being and will ultimately be established. It will never end, it will never be destroyed, so just like with Nebuchadnezzar, God is giving a vision to John that is filled with all kinds of symbols and all kinds of images. So let me ask you a question. How many of you have not read Revelation because maybe it just seems spooky to you or all the people who say they understand it, they're just weird because they're out there. How many of you do not read Revelation because sometimes you're just freaked out as you read and you're like, I just don't understand this, all these images, these beasts, these dragons, all of that stuff. And for some of us, I know for me growing up, 
when it came to Revelation, there's been movies put out, and even as a young kid, my parents would bring me to watch some of those movies, and it just terrified me. And uh, if I didn't see my mom around, I always thought the rapture was happening. I always thought I was left behind. And when it comes to Revelation, some of us were just scared. Some of us were freaked out. So here we are in a crisis in our world with COVID-19, and some of us are going, oh no, this is the time Jesus is going to return turn and some of us sort of are spooked out and we're wondering what's this all leading to what's this all going to bring us to so when it comes to the book of revelation i want you to know you don't have to be scared you don't have to be freaked out by it i get it there's tons of interpretations it's hard to understand uh, we can agree on this fact if we're believers jesus will return and then it's trying to figure out revelation with the multitude of interpretations there is i just say don't be scared of the book but allow the book to encourage your heart because really the book of revelation is all about jesus the book is all about Jesus. Here's how it starts in verse one. It's the revelation of who, church? Jesus. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And here's what revelation is about. Here's who revelation is about. It's about Jesus. And what happens is sometimes people go to the book of Revelation and they read right through the early words and they get into all the imagery. They get into all the symbols and they miss this important spot here in verse one, the revelation of Jesus Christ. And here's why revelation sometimes is just hard to understand. John had a vision. It's like watching a movie and he saw the future and then he's trying to write it all down. The book of Revelation, it's all true, but it's not easily understood as other parts of the Bible are easily understood. Revelation can be quite complicated, hard to understand. So the key to understanding Revelation, the key to understanding any book in the Bible is this, it's all about Jesus. So you go to Revelation and you gotta go, where is Jesus? How do I see Jesus in this? Just as we would read any book of the Bible, we'd always go to this point, to this fact, where is Christ revealed in the scriptures? What does it teach me? about Jesus. And our conviction at Centerpoint Church is that the Bible is all about Jesus, that everything is about Jesus, and that each particular book of the Bible ultimately points us to the person of Jesus, and this book points us to the revelation of Jesus Christ. So it's God actually revealing himself to us. It's God talking to us. It's God showing us who he is. And God does this through history, showing up in places, working in people and with people like John. So if you're watching and you're wondering, what is the difference between Christianity and other religions? Well, this is the big one. It's Jesus is God. The Jesus is the one who it's all about. So it's God revealing himself to us. We believe that everything that needs to be known about God has been made known in the person of Jesus Christ. And that we don't believe just, that we don't believe in speculation, we believe actually in revelation. We don't believe that we can know God apart from Jesus, but in Jesus we know everything we need to know about God. So this book uncovers Jesus. This book reveals him. This book is a revelation of Jesus. And Jesus is telling us how things really are. Verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him. This book comes from God himself. And God just didn't give it to anyone. He gave it to Jesus, who then gave it to his angel, who revealed it to his beloved disciple, the apostle John. Let this just sink in. Let this dignified series of individuals involved in the development of this gift just provoke your appreciation for the Bible. 
you need to see how important just from the chain of people this is. So what I'm getting at is this. Uh, let's just say we go and we visit England and we receive a gift from the queen. That's going to be a very special gift, right? So think about this and how we got the book of Revelation. This revelation is given so that the servants of Jesus will know the uncovering of the things that must soon take place. No matter how much time passes before these events occur, in the light of eternity, they will actually come soon. Here's the thing, church. The events could happen at any moment. So let me say that again. These events could happen at any moment. So don't get caught up in the time. Don't get caught up in the dates. There have been people who have been caught up in that. They've been fascinated with that. And we've had people many times try to predict the end of the world. The real question really is not what's the date Jesus is returning. The question we should be asking people is this, are you ready? Are you ready for the return of Jesus? The understanding here is that it can happen at any moment that this could take place. Verse two says, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Bore witness. It says testifies. Almost every time it's used in the book, it has overtones of death with it. In fact, the word for testify is the word that we use for martyr. It would appear right from the start that we are being put on notice, that this letter is written to the faithful witnesses who are under pressure of the prospect of death. These faithful witnesses should take heart. They should take courage because their witness will not be in vain and they will actually be vindicated. We should also see the reference here to Jesus' death and that martyrdom was something that John's audience had already faced. They've already come to grips with it. John's audience is being called to be faithful, that they would be faithful unto death. They had this prospect that an that at any moment they could die for their faith in Jesus. And it's written during the reign of Domitian, who was worshipped as a deity in Asia Minor during this time. And the penalty for not worshipping him was often death. And the emperor during that time, he was just an evil man. He did wicked things things. He even wanted to be addressed as Lord and God, and the Christians wouldn't address him that way, and many were losing their lives. They were being martyred for their faith. So when persecuted people here, and comes to the book of Revelation and the encouragement from John, this is why they find encouragement in it, because they see a people who are facing persecution and suffering. So it helps us to know that as we read uh, Revelation, the culture was not influenced by Christianity, just like our culture today is not influenced by Christianity. Also notice the obvious, uh, persecuted people tend to feel persecuted. Persecuted people are not normally inclined to feel that God has blessed them, and persecuted people are not normally inclined to praise God. So when persecuted people claim to be blessed, when they claim to uh, be blessed and also praise God, they are behaving in what the world would consider abnormal ways. So we have a responsibility if we follow Jesus to remain strong to the end, to persevere. And what many believers go through in other parts of the world for their faith in comparison to our fear, like here in North America, uh, we don't really face persecution the way that many other Christians face in our world today. So when we read Revelation, we got to think about this, that like today there are more martyrs than any other time in the history of our world. Here we have it pretty good. 
the biggest persecution we'll get is someone might mock us, someone might not talk to us, they might tease us about our faith, but here in North America, when it comes to sharing our faith, having our faith, right now we have this freedom that God in his grace has given to us. So the church in this time are actually experiencing persecution. John is exiled, he's on an island far away from the church, from people. So God here reveals himself so that those who know him are blessed and that they can praise him regardless of their circumstances. So John bore witness to everything he saw and it leads us to verse three. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy and blessed are those who hear and keep what is written in it for the time is near. So there's a blessing number one for those who read aloud the words of this prophecy. So right now, tonight, I am blessed. What I'm doing is I'm reading the words of Revelation. It says there's blessing in that. Those of you who are listening to this by hearing these words, you are blessed because uh, when we read aloud, Faith comes by the hearing of the word of God. The Bible says that. So it's good to be under preaching. It's good to be under teaching. It's good to listen to the Bible and uh, allow it to impact our lives, allow it to change our hearts and our minds. So when scripture is read, feel blessed in that as you listen to it. In addition, it says here, there's blessing for those who hear. So it's just not the reading of the word, it's the hearing of the word. So really the big part of this blessing is tied to the fact that we cannot simply hear these words, we must take them to heart. So we must apply them to our lives. The key to scripture is that we would live that out in our life and that we just wouldn't have this big head of knowledge, but we would live scripture out in practical ways where it comes al alive in our life. This is obedience. Otherwise, the word of God will just become information. The last thing I want you to do in this study is just have a bunch of knowledge and information. I want it to be transforming. I want your life to be transformed by the book of Revelation. Church, knowing God is better than freedom from persecution. So think about this. Knowing God is better than avoiding uh, dying for our faith. Knowing God is better than money. Knowing God is better than comfort. Knowing God is better than worldly fame. And knowing God is better than doing evil to avoid persecution, even from a government that would be against the things of Christianity. And this is what John is facing. This is what Christians are facing in the book of Revelation. Now, uh, go to verse four and five. It says this, John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. The emperor Domitian would often start his letters of cruel punishment with the words, it has pleased the Lord our God in his grace. This was a clue that something horrible was about to take place. And this book here opens with similar words, but instead of being harsh, instead of being cruel in its statement, it's actually filled with hope. It's filled with love. This letter was given to the seven churches in the province of Asia so that the churches would be blessed by what has been written to them. It's seven churches who the book is written to. Now think about this, because when it comes to Revelation, certain numbers are used over and over again. Uh, they're symbols of various things. 12 and its multiples, like 144,000, to symbolize God's people. The number 10 and its multiples, like a thousand, describe the complete amounts of time. Then we have the number seven. It's used to symbolize perfection. It's used to symbolize completion. Here in verse four, the Holy Spirit is described as the seven spirits, a picture of the perfect spirit of God. 
Revelation is written to the seven churches that are in Asia, but the reality is there was more than just seven churches. It's a picture of the entire church, not only here in Asia, but around the world. And we're going to read about seven letters and seven seals and seven trumpets and seven bowls, all of which together symbolize God's complete judgment in Revelation. The number four also symbolizes completeness, particularly in the world. The earth is described in four four parts with four corners and four winds. Sometimes four and seven are even used together. We read about four series of seven judgments on the earth. Various names of God and Christ are used either four or seven times. The seven spirits are mentioned four times. Jesus is referred to as the lamb 28 times, which is seven times four. And seven of those times, Jesus as the lamb and and God as the father are mentioned together. Now, I know what some of you might be thinking. Aren't you reading a little too much into this? Doesn't somebody maybe have a little too much time on their hands to count all those references, all of those numbers? Is it possible that some of these numbers mean nothing? And I'd say, sure, it's possible. But once you see these things over and over again, you start to realize that nothing in all of the universe is accidental. Nothing is by coincidence. That God actually has this plan unfolding. It says here that there would be grace and peace. Grace and peace. So the Christian church readers need grace to persevere in their faith in the midst of tribulation, especially because they have this pressure to compromise. And in the midst of such external turmoil, they need this inner peace that only the eternal God who is sovereign over all things can give them. The one who is, the one who is coming, which can enable them to understand his commandments. He can enable uh, enable them and motivate them to obedience. See, when you really understand who Jesus is, it'll radically transform your life. When you truly get who Jesus is as Savior, you'll want to walk in obedience with him. Confidence in God's sovereign guidance of all earthly affairs instills courage to stand strong in the face of difficulties that test our faith. So today, as we walk through this pandemic, for the Christian to stand in their faith for the glory of Jesus is what our world needs to see. They need to see our witness. They need to see our testimony. They need to see that we are on mission with the gospel of Jesus Christ and that we are standing firm in our faith during this time. See, God is so good to us, church. Center point, I want your heart to be for Jesus. I want your heart to be for the church. And I believe it will be if you know that the grace of God is not just on you. It's not just on me, but the grace of God is actually on us. Like God is doing something during this time. I don't understand it, but it's pretty fantastic. He's being gracious to us as a church. He's pouring out grace. We are a blessed people, those of us who follow Jesus, those of us who know Jesus. This is why I want you to love the church. I want you to serve the church. I want you to be involved in just not tuning in online, but actually saying, okay, during this time, how do I serve? How do I get involved? And there's different ways to do that. And then when we come back where we're physically able to gather, that we would just continue on the mission of the gospel, bringing that into our province, into our communities. See, if you're a Christian and you're in Christ, the reality is God loves you. God cares for you. God is not done with you. God is not forcing you. He's actually inviting you to be on mission with him, to see lives get changed, to see people get saved, to see churches even get planted. I believe God is not done with us at Center Point Church in that area. The only thing that'll, that'll keep you motivated and keep you from being frustrated is to love Jesus and serve the church. So love him 
and serve, get involved. Jesus has peace with us. That's encouraging. So think about this. Through the cross and through his grace for us, center point, we can have hope in this, that we have this grace and peace in Jesus because of what he's done. And there's still grace to be had. Like, there are still people to reach. There are still leaders to raise up. There are churches to plant. There is work to be done. And there is this call from God saying that everybody is welcomed into it, that everybody is brought into this mission who knows Jesus, that he's still drawing people through his spirit to salvation. It says here, God the Father, he who was, he who was and is to come. In the Greek, it implies that God is unchangeable. God never changes. The seven spirits referring to the effective work of the Holy Spirit. See, the Spirit of God is what empowers the church to be effective as a burning lamp of witness in the world. So it's not our doing, it's his leading us to people. So the Spirit of God is always drawing people. He's always leading us to share the gospel, to live out our faith before people. The Holy Spirit is the means by which God affects grace and peace, which the church is encouraged to obedience and witness. So the Spirit's role is about to bring uh, grace. It brings people out of slavery and into the family of God. It equips believers to serve Jesus. The Holy Spirit's work is to sanctify us, to sustain us. And then it brings in the name of Jesus here, Jesus Christ. He is the faithful witness. So Jesus is the faithful witness to the world. He stood before Pilate as the faithful witness. It says that he's the firstborn from the dead. So through that, Jesus Christ has conquered death, Satan, and sin. He rose from the grave, resurrection life. He's the ruler of kings on the earth. By virtue of his death and his resurrection, Jesus was exalted to the place above all. So be careful not to try to get through other means, what only comes through the obedience and, I'll say, movement of the church. We need to look at Jesus, who is the head of our church. No matter how powerful Domitian is here, the emperor in Revelation, the reality is he'll stand before King Jesus. King Jesus is more powerful. It says this in verses 5 and 6. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom of priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. It is his ever continuing character, Center Point Church. He loves us and ever shall love us. His love rests evermore on his people. And he has freed us from our sins by his blood. We have not only been set free from the punishment of sin, we have also been freed from the power of sin in our lives. So the image is that of priests. And before putting on the holy garments and ministering, the priests would wash themselves so that we need to see this symbolically. So spiritually, believers as priests unto God must first be washed in the blood of Jesus. We must be covered from every stain of sin through what Jesus has accomplished for us. And here's what we have. We have Jesus who ministers for us before God in heaven. We are now, though, his people, those of us who have turned from sin and embraced the finished work on the cross. See, the blood of Jesus frees people. It frees people from greed, from anger, from pride, from anxiety. The blood of Jesus breaks the power of canceled sin. So when Jesus rose from the grave, sin stayed dead. Sin was defeated. So for the believer, sin no longer has dominion in our lives. And as priests, it means we mediate the knowledge of God to others. We proclaim the gospel. We share the gospel. We preach the gospel. We live out the saving good news. We announce 
uh, that God has put Jesus forward as a sacrifice to be received by faith. We are both agents of Christ and we are worshipers of Christ. Those who know God best have the most reason to worship, for worship is a response to the way God reveals himself. If we know Jesus as Savior, we're released from our bondage of sin, the power of sin, by identifying in the, by faith in Jesus' sacrifice on the cross and the empty grave. So to that, we say, to Christ be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Then verses 7 and 8, Behold, he's coming with the clouds, and every eye shall see him. Even those who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen, verse 8 now, I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. It says that he's coming with the clouds. That's a reference to Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. It says that every eye will see him. This is Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. John quotes these Old Testament verses, and you can be sure that he will come. You can be sure that you are, if you are his enemy, it says here that you will wail. So that's why you need to repent of sin. That's why you need to believe in Jesus, because it also says, so shall it be. Amen. This is going to happen. Like you can count on it. It's going to take place. Jesus' coming is understood as a process throughout history. The so-called second coming is actually the final concluding coming. It will conclude the whole process. No assurance could better encourage suffering believers than that knowledge that Jesus will come again that Jesus will return, that Jesus will bring justice. Verse 8 says that he is the alpha, he is the omega, he's the beginning and the end. He's the beginning and everything else in between, he's that as well. He's the almighty, he is God. It's not, the, it's not Caesar, it is the one true God who ultimately is king, who ultimately reigns. And in the English, this would be equivalent to God saying, I am A to Z. That's what God is getting at. It's a figure of speech, polar opposites he's putting forth here in order to highlight everything in between. The statement means that God is in control of all of history. So hear me, right now, God is in control. Nothing surprises God. He's in control of it all. He's especially involved in bringing it to an end in salvation and in judgment. God is always and eternal. He is everlasting and almighty. And here's the thing with God. There is no escaping him. Every one of us will stand before him one day. We will not escape God. Nothing has been overlooked. Nothing has been uh, unexamined by him. Nothing was before him. Nothing will outlast him. And what he declares to be true is certain. It's inerrant. It's infallible. It's authoritative. It's reliable. It's totally true. It's totally trustworthy. So here's the thing. When we come to the book of Revelation, you can trust the book of Revelation. You can trust the Bible. Jesus right now sits. He sits on a throne. His work of conquering sin and death and Satan, it's done. It's complete. So, to those who are trying to do good, to those who are trying to earn God's favor or God's love, stop doing when Jesus right now is seated because he has done everything. So I want to point you here tonight to the person and the work of Jesus. What you're looking for in this crazy time is not for this time just to end, but you're looking for a hope. You're looking for actually a savior. And that savior is Jesus Christ. And what we have a tendency to do in our culture is that we just try to work to try to be good or try to be better. And the Bible is saying, stop that. Jesus has already done 
everything for you. In fact, today, Jesus sits on a throne at the right hand of God the Father. Let that sink in. Let that encourage your heart tonight. And I'll pray for us. Heavenly Father, thank you for the hope that we have in Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that this book of Revelation is about you. You're revealed in it. May that encourage our hearts as we walk through this week. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.